Thank you very much. Thank you. That's very nice. I'm sitting down because I got a bum knee. That's what happens when you get older. Um, it's nice to see you all here. I'm sure Orson would be very happy. He probably knows about it. He knew everything. So he probably knows you're here. They're showing the wrong print. <laughs> no, I don't know. Where, I, don't, I think they're showing the longest version. That's the most, yeah, the re most recent one. Which has its own things that aren't quite right, but you, you know we'll never get it right. But it's it's the closest probably to what Orson had in mind. Um, I'm just going to give you a little rundown of what how this came about. This film, a few anecdotes, and I'll get in more into it after. Have you any of you seen this film already? Yeah. Oh. Well, I'll tell you a few things afterward when <clears throat> Jim Naramore and I come out. But um, Orson left Hollywood and the United States in 1948 after making two films that, uh, well, after making Citizen Kane, Magnificent Ambersons, The Stranger, and then Lady from Shanghai and um, the Mac Macbeth, neither of which were received very well. They're sort of classics now, but they weren't in their own time. As Orson said, people would, somebody would bring up the lady from Shanghai and then somebody would cough and quickly change the subject. <laughs> but uh, he went to Europe and spent almost a decade there. And he made Othello, which took him three and a half years because he had to raise money. And he made uh, Mr. Arcadian and was bumming around Europe and doing some theatrical work over there, too. I, I, this has not been written about what I'm about to say, but I think he stayed away from America because of the McCarthy years, because he definitely would have been called up in front of the uh, House on American Activities Committee, because he d was a very strong Roosevelt Democrat. And during the uh, McCarthy years, that was not a good thing to be. He never told me that he stayed away, but I think he did. But anyway, in 56, he came back to Hollywood and did a few things. He um, appeared on the I Love Lucy show, a very funny episode called Lu Lucy Meets Orson Welles. <laughs> it's a very good episode. And uh, he's going to teach me Shakespeare. I don't know if any of you were ever lucky enough to hear him do the radio, uh, Jack Benny radio program he did in the 40s. And uh, Jack Benny's joke was, he, Orson Welles is going to teach me Shakespeare. It was the same joke. <laughs> finally, finally, when he came to the door, the door knocked and they said, it's Orson Welles, it's Orson Welles. Open the door, Rochester. Okay, Mr. Benny. And he opens the door and it's a pause and Orson went, good evening, this is Orson Welles. <laughs> anyway, uh, he came back to um, America, did the Lucy show, did a pilot for a series that didn't, didn't sell called, uh, well, the pilot he did was called The Fountain of Youth, which is an amazing, I think you can see it online, it's an amazing half hour pilot for a proposed series based on a John Collier story. It's an amazing piece of work. It's what television should have, it's the direction television should have gone instead of becoming like movies. But anyway, uh, and then he did a little film at uh, Universal as an actor called Man in a Shadow. As he said, you know, some terrible B, B Western with Jeff Chandler, you know, it was really, it was really the end, you know. And meanwhile, while this was going on, um, Universal called Charlton Heston, or his friends called him Chuck, uh, and asked if he would, and they, they hired Orson to be in a picture called Badge of Evil to play a uh, corrupt police detective. And they called Heston to see if he would play the, uh, the lead. And the person who got him on the phone said, We'd like you to be in this, Chuck, and you know, we've got Orson Welles. And Heston, misunderstanding, said, well, I'll, I'd act in anything he directs. And they said, 
uh, 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 good, we'll get back to you, Chuck. <laughs> and uh, he, he says he'll do anything Orson Welles directs, but we had him as an actor. Well, maybe we let him direct it. Well, maybe we got Chuck Heston. He did Ben-Hur. <laughs> Actually, he hadn't done Ben-Hur yet, but he did Ten Commandments. <laughs> Great line about uh, Cecil B. DeMille who made the Ten Commandments. How, I was talking to Howard Hawks about him one time, and Hawks said, you know, he's so bad, he's almost good. <laughs> anyway. So they decided to take a chance, and they went to Orson, and they said, we'd like you to direct uh, this film, Badge of Evil. Would you do it and play, and play the part? And Orson, who hadn't made a Hollywood film now in uh, almost a decade, said, only if I can rewrite the script. And they said, OK. So he rewrote the script very quickly, in a matter of, I think, two weeks or something. And that's the film that they then started shooting. According to Orson, the shooting went great, and uh, uh, it was extraordinary. He had a lot of fun with it. He kept surprising the studio by bringing in guest stars <laughs> without telling the studio. <laughs> Joseph Cotton makes an appearance in the film. Zaza Gabor makes an appearance in the film. And the, 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 the big surprise was Marlena Dietrich. He didn't tell the audience, he didn't tell the studio that Marlena, he'd called Marlena and said, Marlena, will you come down, see if you can get a black wig because you play a gypsy, <laughs> and come, come, come down and play this gypsy. It's, it's not a big part, but it's a good part. For you, anything, Orson. <laughs> so, and now Marlena takes over the story because she told me about it. She said, you know, I, 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 I went to Paramount and I got Elizabeth Taylor's wig. It fit me perfectly. And you know, I, for years, all through the 40s, I was crazy about Orson, but nothing. <laughs> because you know, Orson likes blondes. D uh, doesn't like blondes. He likes br brunettes, he likes dark-haired women. And I was a blonde, and um, he doesn't like blondes, not interested. But when I put on this wig, suddenly Orson looked at me with new eyes. Could this be Marlena? But nothing happened. <laughs> How did you like yourself in the picture? I don't think I ever looked so good in a picture. I don't know why. Well, maybe it's because Orson shot it. Yeah. I don't think I ever said a line better than the way I said the last line in the picture. Wasn't I good there? You were terrific, Marlena. Thank you. <laughs> anyway. The studio is now watching the dailies, and they say, wait a minute, isn't that Marlena Dietrich? <laughs> What's she doing in the picture? <laughs> anyway, that's how it went. There was a scene that was scheduled to be shot in three days. It was the first scene in the picture. Now, I don't want you to be bothered with having to look at camera angles or look at camera shots because you're, it's a movie and you should just enjoy the picture. But there is a shot, the famous shot in the beginning that goes on, a crane shot that goes on for a while. And Orson said, but everybody, everybody talked about the opening crane shot, but nobody ever noticed this long dolly shot we did in the middle of the picture. Well, it's not in the middle, it's the first third, I guess. In, uh, in the apartment where the uh, daughter of the guy who gets blown up is living with the Mexican boyfriend. And you'll see this, uh, the shot begins over by the Venetian blinds and goes on for five minutes and 20 seconds. It's all one piece of film. It's an amazing piece of work, brilliantly acted, with about eight actors and Orson and Chuck Heston and everybody. And it was the first day of shooting. So they started to, came in at 9 o'clock, and they started to rehearse this elaborate shot. And uh, the front office called the set and said, you know, uh, how much film has he got in the can? And I called about 11 o'clock. Oh, he hasn't got anything in the can. He's rehearsing. He's rehearsing? 
It's been, it's been, he's been there two hours. He's still rehearsing? Yeah, he's still rehearsing. They called around one o'clock. How much has he got now? He's still rehearsing. Still rehearsing, they broke for lunch. Came back after lunch, the call came in at three o'clock. How much has he got in there now? He's still rehearsing. Still rehearsing. Four o'clock, they started to shoot. By six o'clock, Orson said, cut, print, we've got it, and we're now two days ahead of schedule. <laughs> they knocked off 15 pages in, in one shot. I once said to Orson, what do you, what do you think is the difference between doing a, sh a scene like that in one shot or cutting it up into a lot of pieces? Well, we used to say that was what separated the men from the boys. <laughs> so the shooting went splendidly. The studio was crazy about the footage that they were seeing. They loved it. And uh, no problems. He came in close to schedule and on budget, and they said, when are you going to sign and do ten, 10 pictures for us? He thought he had it made. Uh, until they saw the whole thing cut together. And then, as Orson said, something terrible happened. He doesn't quite understand it, never did quite understand it, but they turned against the film. They, they were terrified by it. Something opp oppressed them. They just didn't like it. And uh, Orson wasn't on the set, had gone down to do acting in another picture while the editing was going on, and he came back and found that he wasn't allowed on the lot. This was extremely discouraging to him because he thought he saw a bright future because, as he said, he was able to do shots that he couldn't do in Europe because they have the best technicians in Hollywood, and he was thrilled with the way that it all worked out, but devastated by the, the, um, the reaction. And uh, it was just too dark, and the, the humor was too dark, he, he guessed. He never knew quite what happened. Nevertheless, the editing proceeded without him. And eventually, they, they shot some scenes without him. There's very poignant letters between him and Chuck Heston, where he's telling Chuck not to agree to shoot the stuff and not don't be good Chuck be bad Chuck and refused to do it. But Heston was too much of a company man and agreed to do the scenes, which were you know, shot by a second-rate, third-rate, fourth-rate journeyman director, and they were nothing special. They weren't necessary. They just sort of underlined something that was quite clear in the picture. And then uh, years and years later, um, I was doing this book with, uh, with Orson called This Is Orson Wells, which is still in print. And I met with Chuck Heston, and he gave me, Orson had long since lost it, but um, Chuck gave me uh, this 58-page memo that Orson had written after seeing the universal cut of the picture once. He wrote a 58 or 59-page memo saying what he thought should be done differently. And they paid no attention to it, except for a few minor things, they paid no attention to it. And the picture came out in, Orson, in this studio version, which was not enormously different from what Orson had done. As he said, it wasn't a complete disaster like the Magnificent Ambersons had been, but it was not what he wanted. But he told the French at Cahiers de Cinema, uh, it was an interview that right, at, right around that time, and he said, it isn't destroyed, it's just not as good as it was. Some things that, are, that they tried to clarify are now less clear. Um, then, uh, the, I remember the day the picture opened in New York City. Yeah, for those younger people here who don't know about this kind of thing, it opened on a double bill, two films opening at the same time, at what they used to call the NABES, the neighborhood theaters. It opened all over the city in a double bill with some other forgettable movie. I don't remember if it was the top half of the double bill or the bottom half, but it was thrown away. 
and it got sort of mixed reviews and was sort of forgotten in three or four days. Interestingly enough, my father, who was a painter, brought home a, a, a newspaper, a French newspaper that he used to buy called Ar, A-R-T-S. And on the front page, this is the picture opening in France, in Paris, on the front page, huge photograph of Orson from the picture and a long, long in review, review by Francois Truffaut calling it a masterpiece. That's the difference between the French and the American reactions to the movie. It's often been the French who told us what was good about what we did here, like jazz. <laughs> anyway, um, years went by. Orson, the picture was sort of forgotten and grew in stature. And uh, some years before Orson died, uh, a preview cut was found which included more footage of Orson's, and that was sort of circulated for a while and went on the art house circuit, and uh, it, it was somewhat better than the released version. In fact, uh, I was talking to Jim Naramore about it. You'll meet him later. He thinks it's the best version of the picture that exists so far. Uh, after Orson died, some film scholars attempted to they got a hold of the, of the um, memo that I got from Chuck, and they en endeavored to sort of follow the instructions in the memo, and they succeeded, but they made a few other mistakes. And this is the version you're going to see now. It's the most inclusive version, but it doesn't have the opening music, which I think was a mistake, and a few other things that should have been done a little differently, in my opinion, but it is probably the most inclusive and most comprehensive version of the picture. That's what you're going to see now. Uh, about a month or two before Orson died, we were talking on the phone, and he was not having a good time. He, a picture of his that he was supposed to make fell apart, and another one was falling apart, and he was pretty depressed. He said, God, how they'll love me when I'm dead. And you know, it turned out to be true. Here we are celebrating Orson Welles, who's been dead since 1985, but his name is and stature have done nothing but grow in his own country where he was pretty much a pariah for many years. So I'm glad you're all here to see this inclusive version of the film, and uh, long live Orson. say we were talking before we came up here about how wonderful Dietrich is in this movie. Oh, God. Uh, I, I don't think this movie would be anywhere near as powerful as it is without her. And I, I'm always mystified by it because it's just on the edge of being camp, but it isn't camp. And it has a sweetness to it and a warmth that humanizes Quinlan. She's just crucial to this movie, I think. Yeah, it was a stroke of genius <laughs> yeah. to have her in the picture at all. Yeah. And they had such a, f a close relationship. Oh, a little vodka. <laughs> Thank you, Don. They had such a close relationship, um, uh, he and, and Marlena. She uh, was in his magic act during the war. He cut her in half. <laughs> you can see a version of it in a, a terrible little film called Follow the Boys. I don't know, I think it's on DVD, probably it is. But uh, they were very close, and um, she loved him. I, I was talking to her once, and I said, you worked with so many great directors. She said, no, I only worked with two great directors. What do you mean? She said, well, Joseph von Sternberg and Billy Wilder. I said, what about Orson? Oh, yeah, well, of course, Orson. You know, the, uh, <clears throat> so many, many, one of the things I, I take pleasure in in this film is so many of his stock company, his old, from the old days, show up in this film. Even Gus Schilling, the, the guy at the dynamite thing, and, and uh, uh, Ray Collins and uh, all those people. Uh, but I'm always most shocked when uh, Mercedes McCambridge walks into the movie, that uh, butch member of the Hot Rod Gang. Uh, she's really creepy in this I want to watch. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's such a creepy sequence. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Two years later, Hitchcock made a creepy sequence at a motel, too, <laughs> with Janet Leigh. Yes. 
Yeah. You know, you know the, the, the number of things that this movie has in common with Psycho is amazing. It has the same set director. The camera operator on this film photographed Psycho. Mort Mills is in both films. Uh, it's an amazing set of coincidences or something. I don't know. I don't think it's coincidences. Or I'm sure he Hitch saw the film mm. and thought it was pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> um, I turned to James after it was over and I said, it really is a great film. It really is a great film. I mean, uh, it looked at just from the, film, from the directorial point of view, it's extraordinary. It's an extraordinary wealth of in, in inventiveness and how he connects everything, you know, even the hat falling and the shadow of the hat falling over Orson's face. By the way, Orson didn't look anything like that at when he made the film. He was 45 or, how old was he? I don't remember exactly, but he certainly is distorting his looks. He oh, was, I mean, he, yeah. wasn't, he wasn't heavy. He wasn't particularly heavy at that time. He was completely padded, heavy, heavy, heavy makeup. And uh, he looked the way he looked in uh, Lucy Meets Orson Welles. Uh, quite all right. He was a little chubby, but uh, very attractive still, and not gray-haired or anything. And he loved to tell the story about how he, um, when he was making the picture, he decided to throw a party for all his friends who he hadn't seen in Hollywood in years. So he invited everybody, you know, Jack Warner and Sam Goldwyn and all these other people, the grandees of Hollywood, as he put it, and his friends he hadn't seen in years, and they all came. And he, unfortunately, was shooting late that day, and he didn't have time to change, so he came in wearing the makeup and the padding and everything just because he hadn't had time to change. He just ran back to the party. And he, said, he was very amused. Everybody said, Hi, Orson G., you look great. <laughs> you know, I've got a, uh, uh, just a personal thing I want to say about my history with this movie, uh, which I think is relevant. I saw this movie when it was first released. I was a teenager, and I saw it in Lake Charles, Louisiana. Uh, and it, it was just one of the greatest experiences I've had in the movies. It was just so wild and different from any genre film I had seen before. But that was four years after the Supreme Court desegregation um, case had come along. And um, what struck me then very powerfully about it, and I think people see it less today, is uh, it's not about a real place in the, in the South. It, in fact, it was shot in Venice, California, sort of tricked up to make it look like a border town. Border town. But it, to me, at that moment, it conveyed the violent atmosphere of the South and the tensions over racism. And I think very much that's what Wells was doing with this. The material he inherited, I don't think, had any of that stuff in it. Uh, he never read the book, he told me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I think you're right. I saw it in Manhattan the, the day it opened. And there was hardly anybody in the theater. I went with a very good friend of mine, George Morfog, and we saw. I was a teenager too, and uh, I was blown away by it. I thought it was like an extraordinary work because it, it just it's dazzling, really. I think the restoration is pretty good. I think the cho choice of music at the end is wrong, mm -hmm. but I think basically they did a good job. Yeah, I miss the. Henry Mancini film, a theme that was used at the beginning yeah. of the movie. Wells always wanted, and he, he, he never wanted, could do it. He kept doing it, but the studios kept changing it. He kept, there's something like this in the script for Heart of Darkness. There's something like this in the script for Lady from Shanghai, where um, you see the, the camera tracking a long way down the street, and different sounds come out of yeah. different areas, like a sound montage. And that's what he wanted uh, initially in that long shot at the beginning. but. And Walter Murch tries to reproduce that, but to me it has a phony sound to it. It doesn't sound like what Wells would, would have done with it. So. No, because Orson had a magical touch, you know, and you can't imitate it. Mm -hmm. That's the problem with trying to fix up something. But it's, it's the best version that exists, mm -hmm. I think, mm -hmm. probably. Um, it's kind of uh, emotional for me to see it, actually, uh, because I think of all the work he went through and all the troubles he went through with this picture. And then to be barred from the set, I mean, you know, really, uh, it's terrible. And, one of the, and, the, and the, the studio did incredibly foolish things, uh, or they wanted to. Uh, 
in your book, uh, part of Wells's memo is quoted, that great scene where Charlton Heston is talking on the telephone to Janet Lee, and there's a blind woman yeah. in the foreground of the shot. The studio wanted, I gather, they, they wanted to blow up the image of and get Heston them, and, get and crop them, her yeah. out of the shot. Yeah. And he wrote them begging them not to do that. I mean, the, the things they wanted, anything that was odd or unusual or grotesque or dark, I guess they wanted to get rid of in the movie. Well, Universal wasn't noted for making, you know, the most time, for sure, adventurous yeah. pictures. Mm -hmm. And I think when you look at it, you look at it today and you think, okay, take yourself back to 1958. Well, who was making a film like this? I mean, it's pretty dark <laughs> and grim in a way. He, he says in his interview with you that, that uh, the studio also cut out a lot of comic stuff. Uh, and I, I guess we've lost that, right? I mean, I... I, I I think they, I, I'm not sure what he, what he meant by that, but mm -hmm. uh, there is still some comic oh, stuff. Oh, yeah. I mean, I think the movie is very De Dennis, funny. Dennis bit. Weaver yeah. is very funny. Sure. Yeah. Uh, Orson yeah. called him a Shakespearean loony. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> he wanted to work with Dennis Weaver and he, because he'd loved him on Gunsmoke. Mm -hmm. Orson loved American television. He used to, my, one of my favorite memories when he was living at our house for a while, off and on for a few years, uh, was him tip tiptoeing sort of not to disturb me through my office on the way to his part of the house and saying, Dick Van Dyke is on. <laughs> Watching reruns, you know. You know, the other actor who's funny in the film, and I think he's just a great actor, is uh, Akim Tamirov. Oh, he's brilliant. He, he, he became a big pal of Wells, I guess. Well, Work they did Man several his, pictures together. Yeah, yeah. And he, he's sort of like th that scene, with the, sort of like the Three Stooges squirreling with each other on the, on the street where he loses his, his uh, toupee. Toupee, uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, has this wonderful, grotesque comedy to it. Uh, it's, it's just great. Yeah, Akim Tamarov was a good friend of Orson's. I think he did three or four pictures with him. He's in Mr. Arcade. Mr. Arcade. I don't, I don't he, was, he was Sancho Panza. For, for Sancho Panza and Don Quixote, yeah. the, mm -hmm. the, the, which Orson never really finished. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It was amazing to see this film again. I haven't seen it in 10 years. Oh, my. I, I'm amazed. Oh, then no wonder you were. At least 10 years. I haven't seen it since that 98, so that's, uh -huh. that's 10 years. To me, one of the things that uh, has always been fascinating about the film, and I think you've talked about this, many people have, is, is uh, and this is a kind of a formula that, that Wells used it many times, I think it's very, very key to him, is, is um, you establish these two characters sort of melodramatically opposed to each other, Heston and, 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 and Wells, and one is clearly the bad guy and one is clearly the good guy, and Heston certainly does speak for Wells' own political point of view. But as the movie goes along, uh, Heston seems more kind of self-righteous, and Quinlan seems more human in some way. It's like the, the, the borders that you're crossing are, are become kind of muddled and mixed up, uh, even, even morally and ethically in the film. In some way. Well, that's Orson. He, he did that. He juggled it <coughs> on purpose. Mm -hmm. But Heston speaks to the things that Orson believed. You know, he says it's tough, tough to be a, it's supposed to be tough to be a cop. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Well, maybe the audience has some questions. <coughs> what do you think, Jim? Well, you want to take that one? I defer to you. Go ahead. Oh, gee, I, I'm still making pictures. Yeah. Trying to. Um, well, the thing about Orson Welles is that uh, he had his own vision, you know? And you could say it's quirky, the vision, and it's odd and sometimes strange, the shots and so on, and how he does it. And. Uh, I was once talking to him about that. I said, you know, how did you get the, why, why did you do that crazy angle in this picture? And he always looked sort of troubled when I asked him questions like that. And he didn't give me very good answers. And I would come back to it. That was a wild shot when you did this and so on, whatever. And finally he said, you know, I don't, I'm always uncomfortable with those questions because I don't know what you mean. They don't seem strange to me. He said, you know, I'm sort of like the fellow that goes to the doctor and says, doctor, I don't know what's the matter with me, but I don't feel well. And the doctor says, 
well, all right, tell me everything you do from the moment you wake up in the morning until you go to bed at night. All right, well, I, I, I wake up and then I vomit, then I brush my teeth, and then I, wait, 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 wait. <laughs> you mean every morning when you get up you vomit? Yeah, doesn't everybody? So Orson's point was that that's just the way he saw it. And he was straight surprised that anybody thought it was a peculiar way of seeing it. But don't you think that there w it would be in today's w American movie world uh, just as difficult, if not more, for someone uh, with as a, a, a special and eccentric and sort of advanced way of doing things as well as to make a movie even remotely like this today, do, do you think? I do. Um, I think some people try to make films like this, but they don't know how, and they're, they're, they're sort of um, pretentious. Mm -hmm. and I think that was the point I was getting at that I didn't quite finish, which is that Wells does it out of a genuine artistic urge, and this is the way he sees it. And sometimes I see films that look like they're trying to do Orson Welles, and I don't feel it's organic. I feel it's just superimposed or, or, or fake. I really hate films that, that they make now which are told backwards or from the ending forward or from the middle or where you have to really be a genius uh, to follow it. You know, like Duplicity, two weeks ago, three weeks ago, a day later, <laughs> four months ago, six years ago, Yesterday. <laughs> and they wonder why the audience said, what the fuck is going on? <laughs>
like you haven't seen it through their eyes, you know? There are so many treasures in the, in the pa from the past that I feel sorry for kids who, who say, I don't like black and white. God, you don't know what you're missing. You know, uh, um, I, I think this is connected to one of the things I admire so much about your films, because your, your films are not nostalgic, but they're about uh, uh, some kind of interest in or, or fondness for the past and the sort of heritage of the past, and a sadness about losing any of that. And I think that's a theme in Wells' work, too. I think it, even in Touch of Evil, Tanya's Parlor, all, all those old things in, in, in that the mo That has the most res emotional resonance yeah. in the picture and his talk about his wife who died, mm -hmm. who was killed. Mm -hmm. What else is there to think about, he says. Right. Yeah, well, thank you for the compliment. I appreciate it. I think there's... Um, somebody's writing a book about me in France, and of course they have a perfect French title, Le Cinéma as Elegy. So I'll take that. Mm -hmm. <laughs>
Orson used to say that they picked up on everything except what he really cared about. They picked up on the strange angles and the shadowy lighting and this and that, but they didn't pay attention to things that he thought were important, like the way he told the story uh, and so on. But uh, Wells was, has had a tremendous impact on filmmakers, but it hasn't always been the best because sometimes filmmakers just get pretentious with it. And that's the point I was making about Orson. He wasn't pretentious. That's just the way he saw it. He had that peculiar vision. Um, I don't know how to assess it anymore. Uh, 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 do you? Well, it's a long story. It was a series of events, but uh, Jim touched on it. He was out of the country making a documentary, and they had two. They had two previews that were disastrous. Um, I saw the preview cards. I actually saw the actual cards that the, that, that they had a preview in Pomona, uh, and the preview was with a Dorothy Lemur musical, "Follow the Fleet" or something like that. Not exactly the kind of audience that you want for a rather dark film called *The Magnificent Ambersons*. Uh, it, it, the, 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 the cards were terrible, but there were a number of the cards that said this is the best movie I've ever seen, this is a great film. But the negative reaction outweighed the positive and they got terrified and they cut some stuff out of it. Then they had another preview which was substantially better, but by then they were already terrified. And they just started hacking away at it. <clears throat> and Orson wasn't there to protect it. And his own people sort of turned against it because they got scared. <clears throat> Everybody ran for the hills. And the picture got destroyed. Orson tried for years to fix it by finding the, the footage, but it's, I believe, irrevocably lost. And they dumped it in the ocean in the 50s. I've always thought it's still a very, very great film. Um, Despite that. Right, right. Uh, but um, yeah, you, you know what seems absurd to me is that the studio RKO had hired Wells knowing who he was and, and gave him some money to make a masterpiece. And that's what they wanted, and he delivered a masterpiece, and he did just what they wanted him to do, and they got scared by it. Yes, and Ambersons, I think, was an even better film than Kane in its original form. It's, there's some people who argue that it wasn't, but I think it was. I've seen footage, I've seen stills anyway from, evidently the third act, which was extremely dark, uh, was the part that scared everybody the most but it was the most prophetic part. But you have to remember this was also during the war and people didn't want to see dark films and it was just a, just a lot of bad luck. I was speaking uh, to Peter before we came in and I asked him because I'd always thought this. Those of you who know The Last Picture Show, you know it has a, a scene at the end in a kitchen with um, nice Cloris Leachman and... Uh, Jim and Bottoms. Yeah, Jim Bottoms. And there's a... It's a, it's a recording playing in the background as this conversation is going on in the kitchen. And I said, is that, were you thinking about Ambersons? And he said, yeah. And that's a very powerful s scene. If you, if you haven't seen that movie, when you see that scene, that really has a, a, a power that I think Wells' film would have had too. Yeah, well, Orson ended the film in a nursing home, a sort of a boarding house slash nursing home. Very sort of ambiguous scene. And he had a, uh, two Black Crows comedy record playing in the background. I never, obviously never saw the scene, but I read about it. So I thought it would be interesting in this uh, very dramatic scene with Cloris and Tim Bottoms to have a comedy record playing in the or comedy record from the period, which was called, it's in the book. Definitely a tip of the hat to Orson. Counterpoint, Orson believed in counterpoint. and I, 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 I learned that from him. Well, it's quite a big difference. It's from 1941 to 1958. And even Ambersons is already very different from Kane. It's already much more uh, free. Um, Kane is more constricted in a certain way. And this is ultimate freedom, the way he moves the camera and the kind of shots he does. It's very bravura. Considerably advanced in terms of technique, you you couldn't make this film as a first film. That's what I mean. 
Uh, shall I tell you a couple of funny stories about Orson when we were shooting The Other Side of the Wind, which was um, hopefully one day will be finished, uh, finished editing. Orson asked me to finish it if anything ever happened to him, and of course I've been trying for about 30 years to do that. Uh, there's a lot, a long story about that. But anyway, we were shooting. We had a, about eight or nine very bedraggled crew members who were working for nothing, whom Orson worked to death. I mean, Orson was a div divine with the actors. I mean, he really made the actors feel comfortable and so on. But with the uh, with the crew, he was a little rough. So around three o'clock one afternoon, the assistant director comes over and he says, "Orson, do you, do you think?" Uh, do you think we could let the crew go eat? They've been here since 7. It's 3 o'clock and they haven't had any lunch. All right, if they have to eat, let them go. <laughs> well, Orson, it's, they've been here since 7. It's all right, fine. If they're hungry and they have to eat, let them go. I'm not hungry. I, I was sitting next to I said, I'm not either. I'm going to stay with you, Orson. That's fine. Peter and I will stay here while the crew goes to eat. So he retreated, the crew left, Orson and I are talking for a few minutes, and then he turns to me and says, are you hungry because I'm absolutely starving? <laughs> and I said, I could eat. So we go into the kitchen, and on top of the refrigerator is this, I don't know how to describe it, but it's an industrial-sized bag of Fritos. <laughs> and Orson rips off the top and pours the contents on the table, kitchen table, sits, to, sits down, takes a handful, oh, in his mouth, and oh, oh. so I did the same thing, sat down, oh, and we're looking at each other across the table. And Orson says, you know, you don't, you don't gain weight if nobody sees you eating. Another time, when he was living with us, Sybil Shepherd and I were living together, and he was had his own wing in Bel Air. And uh, Sybil was walking by his part of the house and smelled smoke, uh, you know, like fire. And she said she went to his door and knocked, and said, or "Orson, is everything all right? I smell smoke." Yes, I would just like some privacy, please. A little privacy would be needed here. Well, I just smelled some smoke. Yes, well, there's nothing wrong. We just want a little privacy, please. So she told me about it, and then she went out to lunch, and uh, Orson left, and I came down, and the housekeeper called me into his room. She said, I think Mr. Wells had an accident. What do you mean? And she holds up a white terry cloth robe, and it has a big burn right in the middle of it, Seems he had taken his cigar and he didn't realize it was still lit and put it in his pocket. <laughs> and it burned a hole in his bathrobe. And he took it off quickly and threw it into the bathtub. But some of, it, some of the burn fell on the carpet of the bathroom. And he <coughs> later said he'd take care of it. He never did, really. But, <laughs> but anyway, then about three days later, Sybil gets a present on her t t on the table, a beautifully wrapped present, and she opens it up, and it's a, a, a book, a beautifully illustrated, very expensive book about opera. She loves opera. And inside, Orson had drawn a picture of a house burning <laughs> with a ladybug in the foreground. And he wrote underneath it, Ladybug, Ladybug, fly away home. Your house is on fire, and so is your house guest. <laughs> Love, Orson. That was what he was like. <laughs> oh, he'd love all that. He'd love all that. He goes, because on, on Citizen Kane, he told me, he turned, he turned to Greg Toland, who was a great, great cameraman, director of photography, and said to him once, the problem is that there's film in the camera, isn't it? And Greg said yes. Meaning, it's the weight of the film in the camera that slows the camera down. 
So if the film could be moved out of the camera, you could have a... <clears throat> and Orson said, imagine when they figure out how to do that, and you'll just have an eye, and you can do dolly shots that would, that would, that would make Max Ophuls envious. Max Ophuls was famous for dolly shots. And uh, so he would, he would love it, the steady cam, anything that would give you continuity and movement. And, and I think he'd love digital editing, too, because it goes so fast, and he was always... You know, he'd, he'd love to be able to do it with that kind of speed. I think, I think also that he would like the sound. Mm -hmm. uh, he, I mean, he was a great artist of sound. This, this In Touch of Evil, that, that scene where uh, 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 Vargas is tracking Quinlan with the... With the, 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 the sound there is just a remarkable yeah. mix. Yeah. And, and too bad today we have all of this wonderful technology, but they use it in a kind of a dumb way, you know. Uh, okay, there's going to be some sound over here and some sound over there and back there. Uh, but he was a real artist with sound, and if he had that stuff, I'm sure he would do something really interesting. Well, he was a genius of radio. You know, <coughs> radio was his first, uh, first uh, medium that he conquered. Well, I guess second, theater first, then, then uh, radio. We did the War of the Worlds. We only have time. I'm signal, I've been signaled. We only have time for one more question. Yes, sir. It wasn't his final project, no. There's a very bad cut of it that was made by some Spaniards. Uh, I don't know that it is out on DVD. I don't know. I hate it so much I haven't even looked for it. It's, it's really bad, yeah. Yeah. Well, I think the opening shot, Orson used to say, you have to grab an audience with the opening. You have to really get their attention. Because it's an inanimate thing, it's a screen. Get their attention. Get a good beginning. I think he always felt that a good beginning was important. Uh, Lubitsch used to say, beginnings are difficult. <laughs> and then they would spend weeks trying to figure out the opening scene, Lubitsch. And he wouldn't move forward unless he had an opening shot. So anyway, uh, in Orson's name, I thank you all. And thank you for coming. <laughs>